Some of us may have had enough already. <laughs> well, my response to that is, that is the way the world thinks. Okay. Everybody there? Yep. All right. Yeah. How many of y'all enjoy your free will gift from God? How many of y'all sometimes wish you didn't have that free will? When sin seems to overcome you and you wish God would just take it away or, or just make you completely immune to it and take away that choice. Make your choice for you. It'd be nice, wouldn't it? You know, the problem is is that 
wherever there is going to be somebody who's greedy, there's going to be people in poverty. Can we agree to that? Yeah. Wherever there's the gluttonous, you're going to have the hunger also. Amen? Amen? Wherever you have somebody who is fighting to be in power, you're going to have those who are subject to power. Those that are trampled under feet. It's not God's fault that people take His free will gift and use it for evil. I mean, I've, I've given gifts to people many a times and they've used it for the wrong thing. I've given money to people to help them out, to get them clothes and to buy them something nice and, and I'm almost positive they use it to buy drugs. And if you ever someone who says, well, this person's up here, says, we'll work for food, hungry, have an ache, I'm just going to give him some money. If he buys drugs with it, it's his business. No, it ain't his business. It's your business. Because if you believe he's going to buy drugs, or you think he's going to buy drugs, then don't give him the money. Because you become part of the problem, and you will answer for it. If you want to help him out, if you think that you want to give him something to eat, then go out and buy him something to eat and take back to him. Don't be lazy about your generosity. Okay? God uses us to bless others. Show me anywhere in the Bible where God didn't help others through somebody else. Could God have went to Egypt and destroyed Egypt and took the people out all by himself? Sure he could, but he used Moses and he used Aaron. All right? Could God have uh, made it so that the king himself interpreted the dream and didn't need anyone else from anywhere else to interpret a dream? Huh? No, he used Joseph. He used Daniel. He used Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego. God uses people to do things for other people. When you visit somebody in the hospital, he's using you for that purpose. Everything that God brought into this world was for our good. Now you got to think about this. The world is something that God created he created it without death, without poverty, without rape, without molestation, without cancer, without blood diseases, without poverty, without hunger. Name anything that affects you or affects anyone. Name anything that anyone's in the hospital for. God didn't create that. We didn't create cancer. I know we can create some pretty bad things because I was in the biological field in the Army, so I know what they can do. But cancer has been around here a lot longer than our modern day science, so I know that we didn't create it. So who created it? And why did they bring it here? When you hear people, and I, I know I spoke about this before, but it's part of this message. When you hear about people in the Bible saying he had a, a, a spirit of death and dumbness, or he had a spirit of this, or a spirit of that, and people say, oh, that's a bunch of garbage, they didn't know any better, it's just epilepsy or whatever. There's a spirit behind every disease. There's a spirit behind every cure. When a doctor cures somebody from cancer, he's using the things that God has given him, amen? It's a fight. Why God chooses to fight the way he does, I don't know, but I know one thing, is that he wants us to be like him, and in order for us to be like him, he has to have us do the things he wants done, right? I mean, if, you got a, if, you got a, if you're a mechanic and you want your son to be a mechanic, You've got to train him and teach him how to be a mechanic and then tell him to go fix cars. God wants us to be like him. Him doing all our work and him doing all the good in the world does not make us like him. Amen? Mm -hmm. We've got to remember that. Sometimes Christians don't get this concept, though. Jesus said, or in 1 John it says, If anyone has material possession and sees a brother or sister in need and has no pity on them, how can the love of God be in that person? In James it says, suppose a brother or sister without clothes and daily food. And you say to him, go in peace, keep warm and well fed, but does nothing about their physical needs. What good is it in the same way, faith by itself, if it is not accompanied by actions, is dead. You know, God knows where you're at. God knows the troubles in your life. He knows them before you get them. But our biggest problem and you can trust God with your problem. Do y'all believe that? Mm -hmm. The biggest problem we have is trusting God. Mm -hmm. If you trusted God completely, you'd never lie. Because you wouldn't be afraid of the consequences of the truth. Right? Because you know you have an advocate. 
And even though we know, you know, no one we can trust God and trust in God are two different things. Can we agree to that? Amen. I know Christians, and oftentimes I can get like this myself, depending on what's going on in my life, who love God with all their heart, believe in God with all their heart, try their very best to trust God, because we are in a battle of trust, okay? There's just times where you're, you're going to fall. You're, gonna, you're not going to be up to them expectations. But we're afraid of God, and it's like, we can't find peace in our life. You know, God doesn't punish the Christian. Y'all know that, right? God does not punish Christians. And I've said this before, and people look at me like, you're out of your mind. But he doesn't. I'm going to give you the, the, the reason why I know this for a fact. I'm going to give it to you from a police officer's point of view and from a preacher's point of view. If you do something and you get sentenced to jail, they're going to send you to jail for 30 days for punishment, right? If you're in that dark cell and you're laying there all by yourself and you come to your senses and you think to yourself, why in the world did I do what I did? A lot of you have done that, haven't you? Didn't have to be in jail for it to happen. You've done something that was pretty stupid, something you knew you'd probably get in trouble for, and you sit there and think, why in the world did I do that? I knew I, was, I could get in trouble. I knew it. For some reason I didn't. And here I am suffering consequences. And this person in jail is laying there and he's saying, I'm never going to do this again. With all his heart, he knows what he did was wrong. With all his heart, he knows that he shouldn't have done it. And with all his heart, he's made a determination within him, I'm never going to commit that crime again because I never want to be in this jail again. It's happened, hasn't it? What is he doing when he does that? He's repenting, isn't he? He still has 20 more, 29 more days to serve, though, don't he? Because he's under punishment. God doesn't punish. God has promised us that the very moment we're sorry for our sins and ask forgiveness for our sins, what did he say? I am faithful, I am just to forgive you of all your sins and cleanse you from all unrighteousness. And he continues to say, I will cast your sins as far as east is from west, which I'm going to forget them. I'm going to remember them no more. Amen. Why would God continue punishing after that? See, for a Christian, it's different. Your sins and the punishment for them sins, Christ took upon his shoulders on the cross. Amen? Amen. He carried your sins and he carried your punishment. Now, I'm not saying that God doesn't discipline you. You get out of the will of God, God will discipline you. He will spank you. He will... However you want to look at this discipline. He'll yell at you sometimes. Sometimes he'll give you a nudge. Sometimes he'll twist your ear. And sometimes he'll twist that ear just to get you up high enough so that he can spank your bottom. Okay? Whether it's through finances, whether it's through relationships, whether it's through your job, whatever it might be. But God disciplines. And there's a difference. Once you repent, the discipline stops. Because God said, I am a fair and just God. Amen? He condemned the people for having unbalanced scales. People say, I'm not worthy. Well, you are worth something because God said it's a sin to pay for something more than you're supposed to. And he gave Christ for your life. Your eternal life. Not only that, he went on to, to uh, reiterate that and said, you will be heirs and joint heirs with Christ. So if you're a Christian and you're here and you're afraid of punishment... Stop being afraid of punishment. If you feel like you're under discipline, figure out why and ask forgiveness and it'll, it'll end. Okay? Now, let me say this. Consequences sometimes continue. Okay? Young ladies and young men, they know better to, than to um, have sex outside of marriage. If they do, they have a baby. They can ask forgiveness and be forgiven. God will not have any discipline after that. But you still have consequences to deal with. Amen? Amen. So there's a, can you see the difference between punishment, discipline, and consequences? We have to live with our consequences, but God said, that's nothing more than a fiery furnace and a red sea that I can get you through. Mm -hmm. If you trust me. Amen? If Amen. you trust me. How many of y'all have ever seen the movie about Revelation? Uh, the end of times. The mark of the beast. 
You know, if you ask people about Revelation, even Christians, the only thing they think about is end of times. They, they refer to Revelation as the book of prophecy. And prophecy is always a bad thing. At least that's the way the world looks at it. It's something that's bad. It's something that we don't want to have anything to do with. They, they, it's, it's, a, um, it's a book of death. It's a book of misery. It's a book of torture. It's a book of plagues. It's a book of the Antichrist. And the problem is the Antichrist isn't even mentioned in Revelation. It's mentioned in John. The book is the revelation of Jesus Christ, and he's a hero in the book of Revelation. But the problem is, there's so many things about God that scare you, even to the Christian, that we avoid. It. We don't want them to do it. And the reason for that is because we are either in rebellion to God, or we don't trust God, or we believe in God, but we just haven't committed to God. There's a lot of things in our life that keeps us from peace, and it ain't right. The Bible says, Excuse me for just a second. In Matthew, Jesus said, With man this is impossible, but with God all things are possible. Now I want you to think about what that says. Is it saying that nothing is impossible for God? Because we know it's impossible for him to lie, right? To be tempted? To sin? To stop loving us? So is it saying that, that with God everything is possible? Let's read it again and listen to it. With man, this is impossible, but with God, all things are possible. So is he saying that with God, nothing's impossible, or is he saying, with God, nothing is impossible for you? Mm -hmm. You know, an angel came to Jesus and said, you are a virgin and going to have a baby. He didn't say you're a virgin, but he knew he was a virgin. You're going to have a baby. He said, how is this possible? You know, I love that word, possible and impossible. How is this possible? I didn't even know a man yet. And I paraphrase. He says, well, the Holy Spirit's going to come. He's going to come down and he's going to make you pregnant. Without sin, without sex, without fornication, it's going to be immaculate. In other words, he's just going to touch you and, and you're going to become pregnant. Now, this defies the laws of physics, don't it? It defies, defies the laws of biology. It, it, it even defies the laws of mathematics. You ever, see, you ever notice how God can defy laws that he's made? Because he's the only one that can do it. The law of, math, uh, of mathematics, God's defined them. Because Jesus said that when a man and a woman are married, they become one. So where else in the world is one and one make equal one? Amen? <coughs> when Mary became pregnant, it was one and one equals one. With God, it was one and one equals three. Amen? When a man and woman get together to have a child, it is one and one equals three. And you can go on and on and on. But God has the ability to defy that. She didn't have the possibility of ever getting pregnant without another man. Even today, it's impossible. I mean, the man don't actually have to be there anymore, but a part of them has to be there. Right? But with God, with God, nothing is impossible for you. And God wants you to know his true strength. And you'll never know his true strength until you use it. And sometimes we're forced to have to use it. Oftentimes, we don't understand why we should have to use it. But we do. But I want you to read that again when you get home. With God, nothing is impossible. The future. A lot of us don't like that. How many of y'all have parents who told you right and wrong, what to do, what not to do, and the consequences thereof. Did you ever notice how much your parents are like God and they don't even know it? How much we are like the world sometimes as children and we don't even know it? God says, if you do this, all will be well. Your parents say, mind me and you won't get spanked. Right? If you don't do this, God says, you're going to get some rough times and you might even get spanked. I know we all heard that from the parents, right? Now, here's the thing about the way our parents speak to us and the way the Word of God speaks to us. We all have the same reaction. We either listen or we don't. 
a lot of times we'll look at the Word of God the way we do our, our parents because our parents are talking from experience from long ago, right? I don't know if y'all know, I, I've even went home and I've told, told my wife's story and I say, yeah, this old man told me this. And I find out the old man's the same age I am. <laughs> Alright? So you tell your kids something and what they're thinking about is ancient times. Oh, that, that happened a long time ago. I just... It's not the same. I mean, I'm not, it's not the same as it used to be. It's not, it's not the same as it was when you were growing up. It's completely different. No, it's not. No, it's not. Your clothing's changed. Your hair's changed. Your music's changed. But everything that happens in the backseat is exactly the same as it happened. You know, I can go back as far as a coach and buggy. I can go back as far as behind a rock. Everything's still the same. Okay? All the deception, all the lies, all the desires, they're all the same. Nothing's changed. Okay? So, you have your parents telling you these things, just like the Word of God, but we as children say, well, he didn't mean it that way. Well, yeah, but that was a different time. How many of y'all have heard that? Yeah, but that was a, that was a different time. It's, it don't, it's not the same anymore. We don't listen to that anymore. But the problem is is that we are facing a bad time in our lives right now as a church. Okay? 50 years ago, preachers were saying, it's getting close, it's getting close, it's getting close. I'm telling you, it's right here, right now. Amen. Wednesday, they were trying to vote on a law that would make it illegal to call a newborn a male or female. Because they want the child, when they reach the age of five or six, now keep this in mind, I want you to think about this, when the child is five or six to make up their own mind of what, what sex they are, okay? Why five and six? Because they're also wanting to pass a law that anyone can have consensual sex. Anyone. And they're trying to sneak an age in there for everyone to accept so that when a, a, a child reaches five or six, they can say, well, I'm a, I'm, I'm a boy or I'm a girl, whether they are or not. Don't think that they're not going to use that age frame when they start saying that no matter who you are, you can have consensual sex. It's here. I don't know if you understand it, but the laws are already written. They just haven't been passed. And people right now in Congress and in the Senate are trying to pass these laws. They are. And you can say, well, it'll never pass. Well, 50 years ago, there are a lot of things that wouldn't be what they are now. Amen. I mean, something as simple, I mean, religion, yeah. They've always battled God and religion. They've always hated the Christian. Jesus said, you know, they hate you, but they hated me first. Expect that. But who would have ever thought that somebody would kneel during the national anthem or that they would burn the flag and they wouldn't care? Or that, or that a group of terrorists would bomb a building and kill thousands of people, and then we would allow them to build a mosque there. It don't make sense. Nothing makes sense anymore. The Word of God has, has given us things to look at. In Jeremiah 6, 16, Thus saith the Lord, Stand ye in the ways, and seek, and ask for the old paths. Where is the good way, and walk therein? and ye shall find rest to your souls. But they said, We will not walk therein. I also set watchmen over you, saying, Hearken to the sound of the trumpet. But they said, We will not hearken. Therefore hear ye nations, and know, O congregation, what is among them. Hear, O earth, behold, I will bring evil upon this people, even the fruit of their thoughts, because they have not hearkened unto my words, nor my law, but rejected it. Sounds like a parent, don't it? Do, do things the way we used to do them. Do, look, at the, look at the old way, the simpler way. Look, look, don't try to put so much into it. Have some common sense about you. Do what's right. But the world's saying, no. I do what you say. I'll do what I want to do. A lot of Christians do the same thing. You know, there are a lot of Christians that fear the Word of God so much that they try to change the law. Uh, Revelation, the suffering book, the vengeful book, the end of time book, you know, the movies. Let's get back to the movies. How many of y'all seen a movie about the Antichrist and 666 and all that? Have you ever noticed this about the movies? 
God doesn't have much to do with it, then it's some librarian or it's some scientist or some police officer or somebody that teams up with somebody else and they defeat Satan. I've even seen where, where humans defeat Satan in the evil and then God like makes an appearance right near the end. You know? So what are they trying to tell us? That humanity has power over Satan? And that humanity has the power over the prophet, prophetic word of God? That we can change the things that are supposed to happen without the will of God? Without the presence of God? If you don't believe me, go watch any movie you want to on, on the end of times, Revelation, The Mark of the Beast. God has nothing to do with it other than he prophesied it, but we as humans have the power to change it. And we do it for the good. And I guess that's why God doesn't step in and say, well, no, I, I said it, but because you're, you're a good guy, you know, I, I'll, I'll, let, I'll let it slide this time and I'll just make my word more valid some other time. It don't work that way. There's a lot of ways we sneak things in. We avoid it, we reject it. The appointed times of God will always come to pass. What God says He will do, He will do. There's nothing that we can do about it. Okay? I had a man ask me last Sunday at church, do you believe that, and I've talked about this, so I'm not going to dwell on it. You're all like, oh yeah, right. He said, do you believe that we're going to be here when the plague's hit? I said, sure we're going to be here when the plague's hit. I was at a, a Baptist convention one time, and um, it was all preachers. Yeah, Methodist guy was there. And uh, it was it was tickets bought for me and bought by somebody else, and we enjoyed it. We loved it, um, and and I'd love to go back again. But I was talking to two pastors out in, in uh, or preachers. I don't know if they're pastors, but they're preachers out in the hallway, and we were talking about that. And this one guy comes up and he goes, "You mean to tell me you believe that the Christians aren't going to get raptured out before uh, all that stuff happens?" I said, "No, I don't believe we're going to get raptured out before all that happens." And he got so mad at me, walked away, wouldn't, wouldn't let me talk about it. But that's what we do. We allow fear to distort, and I want you to think about this because this might hit home with some of y'all. We let fear distort who we are, how we look, our relationship with God, who God truly is, how much he truly loves us, and our ability to trust him. Fear has it down pat. But the thing about it is, we don't have to allow fear to do that to us. We don't have to walk on pins and needles around God's throne. Mm -hmm. Okay? God didn't throw needles out there for us to kneel on because we're so unworthy. God has made a path by the blood of Jesus Christ to just walk up and give him a hug and say, Thank you, Father, for your love. Amen. Worshiping God is easy when there's no fear involved. Trusting God is easy when there's no fear involved. The problem is, there's fear. The question is, how to conquer it? Well, you have knowledge. Knowledge that we learn from the Word of God. That gives us faith. Okay? Wisdom. Our life experiences. And discernment. How we apply these things. You know, um... Like I said before with the ladder, you know, I believe it's a ladder. I have faith that I can climb the ladder and get on the roof. It's whether do I trust the ladder or not to get on the roof. If I don't trust it, you know, my belief falls short, so does my faith. Amen? You've got to have that personal, reflective experience with God where you know you've been touched. You can go back in time and say, no, this giant before me can't, can't stand I've slew, slew lions and bears all by God's help and I can trust Him in this calamity right now. Amen? Amen. It's hard at the time. And God knows it's hard at the time. And let me tell you something else as a Christian. God knows. You know why He knows? You know why He knows it's so difficult? Because He sent Christ here in the flesh. 100% human, 100% divine. Amen? The Amen. Son of the living God. There's three crosses that were there on Mount Calvary that day. And they bear witness to revelations. You see, because you had Christ 
who was there that everyone present thought was weak and defeated. You think the world thinks that now? Of course they do. You had two people that were being crucified with him. One looked at Christ and accepted him as God's Son and the Savior, the Messiah. At the beginning, if you read your Bible, they were both mocking Christ. But this man came to the, to the, to the uh, understanding that, yes, this has got to be the Son of God. This has got to be the Messiah. Jesus, remember me when you enter your kingdom. In other words, save me. And Jesus said, you will be with me in paradise. Amen? That is those of us who trust in God and want God. But then you had the other man who was also being crucified who continued to rail, and who continued to be part of the crowd. See, that man on the other cross, he separated himself from everyone there and concentrated on nothing but Christ and the love of Christ. The other man, he stayed with the crowd. He stayed with the world. Let me tell you something. Don't be afraid at the end of times, except for those that you love that won't know Christ, because, and even those that you may hate, and I hope you don't hate nobody, because... Even while they're being crucified, they're not going to want to let go of the world. They were mocking Christ the way the Romans were mocking Christ. They took part in all of this. There's many people that are going to take part with the beast, part with the Antichrist. Even though the beast and Antichrist has plans to destroy them. But they don't want to leave. They don't want to leave the world. Because the world today is looking at Christians and Christ like they're defeated. Just remember, your greatest moments in life and your greatest reflections will be those where you had to climb a mountain. Okay? If you're on top of your mountain, get off it and climb another one. Because the most joy you have, the most strengths you gain, and the greatest confidence you'll ever have is climbing the mountain, not sitting on top of it. Father God, we thank you for this time together. We thank you for your word. We thank you for your prophecies. We thank you, God, for being that Father who has given us the advice through this time. I pray, God, that we can find in your word, God, a time and a moment and a motion of trust, joy, and peace. Where we can just look up and say, you love me more than anyone else in this world has ever loved me. And if I could trust them to understand my weaknesses and, and, and still forgive me and, and still love me through all the times I fail you and, and, and to care for me the way you do, how could we not find peace? How could we not find joy? Knowing that the struggles we face are not because of you, God, but because of the world, because of ourselves. God, we don't have to be afraid of you. We don't have to be afraid of your word. We don't have to be afraid of any times. All we have to do is what your word says to do. Help other people. Be there to be like you. Understand that when we do things, we need to be like you to do them. And that you need us to do that things. It's all for our benefit. Everything is for our benefit. And I pray, God, that this benefit is a, is a blessing to other people. And, God, that it will bring other people to this church. And, God, that we will be more Christ-like in all things that we do. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. From 283.